Bachelor Reel, Living or Dead, who matches the criteria on cards I'm going to show you. So we're going to play this game as a beginning of our session in this afternoon at the Beta Zone. So when you see the two words on the screen, shout out a person, fictional or real, living or dead, who matches the criteria. Male wizard. Harry Potter. We got a Harry Potter right in the front row here. <laughs> All right. You would get those cards in this game, OK? All right. Nerdy CEO. Wow, it was unanimous, Bill Gates. Wow, wow. Does he know that? Musical failure. This could be culturally specific. Anyone? Combination? I think of, does anyone know Dr. Spock from, from, uh, from, from uh, Star Trek? He, he actually had several record albums, Leonard Nimoy. I would maybe class, classify that. Um, they, were, they were not great. How about this one? Pardon? Shout it out. Marie Curie, Marie Curie, she could, she could count, I think. Yep, yep. And how about this? Name your Iranian economist. Abbas Mirakor is one, for example. Um, so, all right. So we're going to get, I'm going to explain what, what this game is about in a little bit. But first I want to just introduce my background, why I got into thinking about games in the first place. You know, I, um, I, it's, it's kind of unlikely that I'm here speaking with you today. I grew up um, in the Midwest of the United States. My grandfather died a homeless man um, in New York City. My father was a factory worker who had an eighth grade education. And I was a sickly child. And I spent more time in hospitals than I did in uh, climbing trees or doing things that other kids did. So, so I, you know, what was interesting to me, of course, was that I, I, I was just a kid. I didn't know that I was, I was uh, in any way disadvantaged or, or poor. We were in a rich country, the United States. But I also knew that the world did not seem to have many options. And for people like us, we didn't really think that we could do a lot to change the world. Things started changing for me one Christmas when I got this Atari 2600 um, uh, gaming console. We hooked it up to a used black and white television set, and I started playing video games. And I, like I really started playing video games day and night. I played hungry. I, I stayed up. I just kind of really obsessed. You've seen probably your children doing the same thing um, at home. And what's interesting is that I, I played video games before I read great literature. I played video games before I saw great art. And for me, um, video games were something that were that was profound. There were these little worlds that, that, that had rules that I could understand and master. And that was really special to me. And it didn't occur to me, for example, that game that girls didn't like technology, because I certainly like technology. And these magical portals became things that I became obsessed with, um, hanging out in video game arcades. Uh, they, the games reacted to me and to my choices. And when you're a kid, you rarely get to make big choices. And so for me, games changed my world and the way I saw myself. Beyond reading and multiplication and all the clever things they teach you in school, I learned things from video games that now research is backing, that, we are, that video games can teach persistence, that they can normalize failure and, and, and an iterative try and try again. That, um, that it's OK to not know the answer, but to keep experimenting and trying out. To come up with un unusual solutions, strategizing and reflecting. So if someone had told my family that a video game would actually change my economic status, send me to college, get a PhD, all of these kinds of things, that would be very surprising, I think. Um, and I don't think anyone would have, un would have really believed that at the time. But it's something I actually do believe. But beyond me and the story about how I got into video games, you know, there, there, there are pressing problems that all of us are here at the summit, at the, at the forum to deal with. Um, climate change, poverty, uh, sustainability issues, uh, gender inequity is a big topic, of course, this year, sexual assault. These are all massive topics. And for me, the first idea that comes to my mind is, well, what could video games do in that space? Um, Normally, we tackle the world's biggest problems through treaties, through, through policy, through careful laws, through design. But, but history keeps repeating itself. And what could we use uh, games and something kind of fundamental to human history to do? 
So I make all kinds of games, sports, digital games, card games, and I instinctively see these as methods by which we can actually have conversations and even change our minds and behavior. And I will tell you that the games I make, well, they don't necessarily look like they're solving social problems, and that's what I'm going to unpack in the rest of my talk. I'm going to share with you four themes or four kind of surprising and counterintuitive ideas that I have um, discovered in the last 10 years of working in video games that might, um, might st uh, stir some conversation for you uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the Q&A. So first theme is that video games, and all kinds of games really, can lead to open-mindedness and they can disrupt stereotypes. Um, a few years ago with my research team, uh, we came up with a game that we played at the beginning of the session. The game is called Buffalo, and you match the, picture, uh, the, the person living or dead to these, um, to these cards. Now, at first it was a terrible game. It was about science. And you, you had woman, chemist, female, uh, biologist, male, physicist, and this was not a game anyone would ever play. It was terrible. I mean, well, really bad. Um, but that's okay, because you can iterate. And so we iterated and iterated and came up with a really um, kind of fun party game that people can play. Now, just, now, what's interesting about the game is that after 20 minutes of gameplay in an empirical study, we found that social identity complexity and um, average universal orientation scale, which are the ways that psychologists measure bias, showed significant changes. And in fact, the game seems to lower people's biases, even after 20 minutes of gameplay. We don't know how long the effect lasts, but what's interesting is that games are played over and over. So if you think about it, the game could be inoculating us against our biases and stereotypes. And in fact, the inventor of the IAT test, if anyone's familiar with that test for bias um, at Harvard University, among other universities, um, claims that the only thing that can really counteract our biases and stereotypes are counterintuitive examples which we find in the game through just random play. The second game, I, uh, the second situation I want to talk to you about is, is fictionalization. And this is, this is going to be a shocker. Um, the more fan I'm asserting that the more fantastic and fictional the story, the more effective the message. So I was working with a public health group in, uh, in the United States, and they wanted to increase va vaccination. And we, they said we could make another uh, educational pamphlet or flyer, but we really need to get people engaged in this situation. We made a game called Pox to get people talking and thinking about vaccination. It's a, it's a participatory game where you're um, collaborating with other players to stop the spread of a virus. Well, one gamer said, I really like zombie games. And I thought, great, we'll make a zombie version of the game. So we made a board game version of the game, a zombie version of the game, and of course, an iPad version of the game, and did again, empirical studies on how people are playing these games, both in, uh, all, all of the games in person. And we found some interesting stuff. The most effective game at shifting attitudes and behaviors, or shifting attitudes and mindsets, um, was the zombie game. Yes, zombies. Think about that. OK, I won't act out zombies right now. Uh, zombies have come up before today. I mean, today, this is the second time I'm talking about zombies. I don't know why. It's not it's on my head. OK. Um, games can help us associate, make new mental associations, and possibly help save the planet. We worked with climate scientists to think about ways in which we could get people recycling. This is a common thing. Everyone wants to have people recycling. There's a popular game called Cards Against Humanity. Some of you may have heard of it. It's um, a horrible game. It's, it, it has a lot of negative things. You do horrible things. And uh, uh, you can see some of the example kinds of questions over here. Um, this is like the kind of horrible thing that would happen in the game. It, it, it's it's over-the-top humor, very dark humor. We inserted, we made our own version of the game, Cops Arrest Manatees, and inserted climate-related themes, things about penguins, things about the Arctic. And they weren't nice. They were just inserted in there in the same theme of the game. And then we did a devious study in which we, <laughs> our IRB allowed us to have a study in a bar. We, had, we gave everyone cups uh, of water until the study was done. Then they could do what they wanted in the bar. Um, and we monitored their recycling behaviors. Now, baseline control condition, just playing a regular version of the game, unfortunately, the baseline recycling rate was 10%. 
that's not so great. It's really embarrassing, actually, especially in an educated town uh, of, of New England. But in playing the climate-related version, where there was some climate-related content snuck in, we had a recycling rate of 30%. So, huh, that's very interesting. And how we did that was we actually put invisible ink, spy ink, on the cups. We went through the garbage. You know, it was awesome, actually, to just like, all right, we're going to find out what is in this recycling. So it was uh, pretty, pretty uh, hands-on research in that, that particular one. Now, um, this is an artwork by Yoko Ono. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Play It by, Play it by Trust. It's from 1966. And this is Yoko Ono's uh, attempt at, to, to get us to really look at conflict. She was a big, and still is, a big pacifist. Um, I like this example because it, it helps us rethink even common games, even games that are very old um, in culture and how we could actually redefine them. And can we look at, game, at social issues through new perspectives? So one um, last example I want to give you is a sexual assault, which is something that seems very difficult to make a game about, right? Is there, is there um, the, the name game just seems kind of offensive. So what we did to work on uh, this project to, do, to increase bystander intervention when there are issues where uh, college students may be faced with sexual assault, you know, in the United States, one out of five women on college campuses faces attempted or completed sexual assaults, which is a, 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 the most violent crime on US college campuses. Um, we made a comic book game in which these college kids are on a spring break trip and they go into an alien planet and they see weird situations and they have to intervene. And in our study of this game, we found that playing the game, especially with male college students, the first year college students, significantly significs their uh, shifts their attitudes and self-beliefs that they can effectively intervene as bystanders. Um, again, the secret to this and to all the other games is that we don't reveal the purpose of the game. They're, we're assessing stuff. When, when, you, when you play this game, you do not think it's about sexual assault. No one, no one, it's, it's not up obvious at all. It's, a, it's, it's actually kind of funny, you know, they're going to sporting events and eating pizza and stuff. The sexual assault stuff is, is buried in there. So by using these highly fictionalized worlds and making a game that does not preach about the dangers of anything, we have uh, messages that can actually sink in. Now, all of these games work by a process called embedded design, where we're artfully weaving in content and shifting attitudes and behaviors. You could call it nudging as well. Um, and this is something that we've been working on for the last 10 years to, um, to see how we can actually address problems in real ways. You know, our challenges don't change when we know more facts. And we all here really find facts very, very important, but that's not that's not the only thing that's going on in the human mind. You know, we grow up playing and experimenting and imagining new worlds and systems. So, so we need to be able to, to, take, to take other elements besides facts into our decision-making processes. Can we keep a play spirit alive um, as we move forward uh, as, as in any sector? Can we actually free ourselves to make new models and invent new voices uh, for new solutions to social issues. Just imagine what worlds are possible if we use games to reinvent our futures right here at Davos. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you very much, Mary. Um, for all of you here in the audience and at home watching uh, online, um, there's a URL here where you can uh, post questions, upvote and downvote them, and I get them here on this iPad. Great. Um, first off, um, I was thinking this is, all these games are really good in that campus situation, but there's a lot of folks here who are CEO of a large organization, right. they're in, responsible for overseeing part of a country, or how do you take this into the real world? Mm -hmm. So some of the games are actually commercialized as commercial products. You can buy Buffalo at Amazon.com. So there's the, the kind of uh, infiltrating the market. I think also some of these techniques could be policy level kinds of things. Um, you know, the, the FCC in the United States does some regulation. We could actually think about adding pro-social content as regulation uh, in some way um, to commercial products. 
There's also just ideas about human resources departments and exercises and ways you could bring in a play hour. Uh, you know, this is, it, it seems kind of silly, but a lot of people are talking about this as the ludic age. The popularity of video games is not going away, and that's raising all the interest in games. Even the board game industry is very, very uh, up in terms of profitability and scale, and it's in entering China uh, in, a, in a really interesting way. There's all these internet cafes and, and, and board game cafes opening up in China. So, so it's, it's a global phenomenon, and I think you're going to tap into a market and, and a generation that this speaks. This is, this is their native language play. And then if I look here at some of the questions, it's about also the dark side of games. Ooh. So both in a way, can games be harmful? But um, also if you take that to the screen, are, there's a question here, is a board game, is that better than playing on a screen like you did in your youth? Um, mm. how These do we are great questions. Okay, so first of all, the board game versus the digital game, that is very interesting. It hasn't been very well studied. I mean, I mean not many people sit around studying board games, I'll just say. But, and regular games actually, we, we don't know very much uh, from a research perspective. Um, but in the, in, the, in the differences between the, the board game version of our POX game and the digital version of the POX game, players lost more. They failed solving the problem basically in the digital version. Same rules, same interaction, same situation of play. They failed five out of six times and they won five out of six times in the physical version. So there are some really interesting differences about how, and the conversation dropped 30% in front of the iPad, even though it was the same game. So shiny object has something to do with how we interact with human beings. Should we go even further than that? Should we think about, I mean, somebody writes here, Vi uh, violent games yeah. usually tend to reduce helping behavior. So should we regulate that? Hmm. Yeah, so the violence in video games debate gen tends to be the first thing that people think of when they think of games. What I'm trying to do is invent other games. I, I, don't, really, I don't really address the violence uh, debate. The, it, it goes both ways. Some people think that the idea of killing monsters and working out aggression actually is fine. In fact, there's a recent uh, article in Nature that does not have any correlation between violence and uh, in games and real world violence. This is a, it, every, every researcher is going to have this debate. What I'm trying to do is say people like to play. The game industry also includes casual games, Candy Crush, all these other kinds of things. They include board games. Why don't we make interesting new kinds of games that don't exist that are pro-social? Why not? And we might as well compete with the violent video games. So I'll take questions in the audience here in a second. So think about them and maybe we can get a microphone out. Uh, but before we do, yeah. have you seen any governments implementing games in a successful uh, way mm -hmm. to impact a larger portion of the population? Well, there are some initiatives, um, and I'm not sure if they're government initiatives, but I would, I would wager that the, that the, the game, um, th there's a really great anti-cancer game in the UK um, called Remission that actually gets kids to stick with their chemotherapy re regime. And that's been uh, through a lot, a lot, a lot of trials. Um, and, and it's shown that it really does help kids adhere to their medication and their, their kind of uh, medical patterns. So, so this stuff is still emerging. We don't have, you know, we don't have great data yet. Um, and it's scattershot. But I think that we're seeing what I don't want to see is we think games are about shooting. We want to make kids like math. We just shoot math problems. And then that goes into schools. Like, that's the bad way to do it. <laughs> and I've seen this, that has also come up, because people, if they don't feel comfortable knowing about games, they'll just, oh, well, maybe that's the right solution. So, so it really is working with designers to unpack some of this stuff, and people who think about the values and social impact in a very critical way. So I'd like to take some of the questions of the audience here. Who would like to pose a question? Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you for this. C could you, um, uh, to, to come back, even though you, you separated both uh, ideas of the violent, the violent games and your idea of a game, could you introduce your idea of a game within these kind of violent games so that you can actually, because it's, they're very addictive and because a lot of people play them, especially now the Fortnites and all the things that you have on the internet where 
kids really like play together and socialize without being effectively in the same room, yeah. but they talk together, they exchange yeah. with, mm -hmm. with the cast, etc. How can you tweak, basically, use yes. this thing? Oh. Yes, definitely. I, uh, any of these techniques could be brought into a large-scale game and, and change the dialogue, for example. Change the con you, can, you could change the conversation in the help, kind of in, in, in the menu itself and the options. Um, the game industry has not been super interested because it's, it's, not, it, 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 it's not value added for them. It, it's like it costs more money to do that and then they don't, they don't really care yet. I think they might care at some point. There's no regulation. Um, so breaking in and getting people to, you know, to make a cooperative, you know, nonviolent mode in World of Warcraft, you know, people do that on their own, but it's, it's, a kind of, it's, it's really hard to structure that kind of intervention. So what I'm trying to do is get the proof of concept and, the, and, the, and, the, and models out and a kind of theoretical framework of how other people could do this. And then um, I think as generations change, uh, that changes who gets to make games. The student, my students actually want something broader. Like my college students want something um, that's more rich, that is more pro-social. It, it, I think millennials are, are, are more conscious of, at least some of them are more conscious of these issues. And they're gonna be the game designers in the next generation to do this. But it's a, it, that's, that's one really important avenue. And that's talking about some of the games that we, we know quite a bit about. There's this new trend and, um, uh, about eSports. Yes. So how do we see it there? Well, eSports is really interesting because um, the games they use are, are, again, games that could, we could intervene within, right? Um, but the eSports dialogue so far has not been really, um, a, a really kind of holding on to values. But, but I will say that the, their eSports are entering institutions at a very fast rate. And I think you'll see a, a very large kind of explosion of eSports. Now, how, how can you make you know, more cooperative esports? How can we shift the model? This is a really good question. And I think, it'll, I, I, I think it will come with certain kinds, with, with the proliferation of diversity in games. I mean, right now, the US game industry is only 22% female. Um, and that's an all-time high. <laughs> That you know, actually, it, it's exactly the number here, right? Wow, this is yeah. interesting. Whoa. But these are not gamers, I think. <laughs> Me, you never know. You never know. I'm, you know, and that's the other thing. Who calls themselves a gamer is another interesting question. You know, many people are sitting on the bus playing solitaire or whatever on the airplane. That I, I'm going to call you a gamer. You might not self-identify as a kind of gamer, but it is a, you are in the game market, right? So you are thinking ludically. Um, this is an 8,000-year history of, of, of ga structured gameplay that humans have developed. Let's think a little historically. Gamers have existed for a long time. And um, I see here a question. Do you think game addictions are a serious uh, problem, uh, amongst, especially amongst children? And I, I myself had to think about Ready Player One, the sci-fi books where we're all sp spending our entire lives in, in virtual reality. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, this is, I think that the, the, the biggest thing I'd like to just re uh, unpack is that demonization of video games. You know, I, if, 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 your, if your son or daughter stayed up all night reading a novel, um, would that, why is that okay, but playing a video game maybe isn't okay? Like, what, what, is, what is it about, what is it about the, the video game medium? And it's not just video games in particular. This scare happened back in Dungeons and Dragons time, when in the 1970s, 1980s, dr you know, Dun Dungeons and Dragons was demonized as this, like, horrible thing that kids would go and <coughs> fantasize and tell stories to each other. Oh, my gosh, they're it was suicidal. And there are all these cases about it. I mean, there's a lawsuit. So, so... I, I think this is an example of not being connected to play, of not of, of, of growing out of a play spirit, and it's being adults. So I think uh, maybe adults are a little bit afraid and uncomfortable with play. Uh, I've done workshops with public health officials, and and we you know mod video games and mod regular games for uh, or uh, analog games for different issues, and. People have broken down and crying. Like, I, I had a doctor cry, and he said, this is the first time I have played since I was seven years old. Um, you know, he's a very high-achieving doctor, you know, but it, 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 he, he left it behind. And what, can, what will happen if we bring it back? It's a very big opportunity there. 
Um, there's a couple of questions that are coming up around, can it be used in specific cases? Like, could it be used to, for the acceptance of uh, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual people? Could yes. it be used for um, social equalization? Yes, I mean, uh, wherever we have biases and stereotypes, certainly these kinds of techniques I'm showing you work. I mean, you know, how, uh, they could work in a variety of contexts. Uh, the, the, the Buffalo game breaks up any kind of stereotyping process because stereotypes, think about it, stereotypes are about making thought efficient. I categorize really quickly so that I can make thought efficient uh, and, and move on and capture the very big data of the world in a very quick way. Well, when that's interrupted and you disrupt my stereotype with an unexpected kind of collision of ideas, huh, I have to move around that and think about that. And that can be true with any stereotype that can be disrupted that way. And then if we're sitting here in the audience and people are thinking, or at home, people are thinking, but how do I get started? It's not that logical that, I mean, maybe for you it is easy, but for me it was quite a leap to go from, I want to make people more open towards different stereotypes to game of buffalo. There is a quite a couple of steps there. How yes. do you get from A to B? Where do you even start? I think you start working with designers and you, and you ask the question and, 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 and you prototype a lot of things. I mean, we haven't engaged a playful kind of spirit in this, these very serious issues. It, it, it seems anathema. It seems maybe not right. And I think maybe it's, I don't want to say the only way, but I, I do want to say it's a very promising way to open up people's hearts and get people feeling like they can engage in something that maybe is too frightening in other situations. So can I open it up to the audience? Any other questions that we've got here in the room? Yes, the lady in the back. Can I ask about a, a degree-seeking program for game design? Is, is uh, yes, this a there collegiate are four, program? There are 400 game design programs in the world right now. It has exploded in the last five years. Um, the uh, USC has an entire game design department, game design and production department. This is true at many universities. NYU has a game center with a master's, uh, uh, an MFA, an uh, undergraduate degree. It's, it's all over the place. So there, it's, it's really happening. Um, what my critique of game design, although, is, is that sometimes it happens for the game itself. And my, my real uh, you know, uh, uh, ha happy place <laughs> is when games actually connect to other disciplines and bring us together in solving other problems because uh, games are models of problems and they can be and they're dynamic so this is an amazing uh, useful thing you know everyone wants a simulation of, a, of, a, of, a, of climate change well we can make a model that we can interact with out of paper <laughs> wow <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a really important 21st century skill to actually think about game design as a model for problem solving Is there a website that curates the games that are connecting with social issues in those powerful ways? There is, a, there is an organization in New York City called Games for Change, and it, and it has an annual conference every year, and it has a lot of social issues games, from a more documentary film turned into a game kind of project to the kind of stuff I'm showing to medical things and uh, public health and social issues, all kinds of stuff like that. So I would start with Games for Change, see the kinds of games that are coming out of that community, and then, um, you know, looking at, at research papers, because also we want evidence, right? I think this is another key thing. It's not just about rhetoric, it's about what we actually can find. And for all the things that succeed in my lab, things fail, and that's science. <laughs> so it's important to have that. So we have a question out here in the front, and we'll get you a microphone. Sure. I was just wondering about the cycle time for development, and is, is it an agile sort of approach to it, or is it... Is it an average day, a month or two months? Or? It really depends on the size. So the question was about like, how long does it take to make something like this? It really depends on the size of the game. Buffalo is a card game. You can prototype this on a, you know, in very quick iterations. I think the development time was probably th two, three months, and this is not even a company. This is a research lab with undergrads, by the way. I, I, I only work with undergrads. So, so, very, so it can be, things like this can happen very quickly. Getting it out to print is you know, a, a, a production process. Big, you know, long-scale, heavily budgeted games. I mean, games, 
the, uh, things like Grand Theft Auto can, you know, can cost as much as a blockbuster film to create. So it's, it's really about the scale in which one is working and how fast one can create these things. And also how long the research takes and how long it takes to get published, because that's another thing. Yeah, the lady in the middle here will get you a microphone. Thanks. How long would a game like, I mean, how well would a game like Buffalo translate across cultures, across countries? Have you got uh, research and uh, experience in that? We did, we did actually run Buffalo as a, uh, we, we, we ran sessions of Buffalo and we ran Pox in Ireland um, at the Science Gallery, which is interesting because they have a presence here. Um, and we found similar results. Uh, we haven't, I, I don't really have uh, a, a, a global ability yet to do research partnerships like this, but I think this is a great question. W my observations anecdotally have, I've taken it to things like the Salzburg Seminar and lots of like global events. It's a great bar game. It really works well in pubs and various, you know, and so if, you, if people don't really have a reality TV show and it says reality TV star, people just throw that card out and get, so it, <laughs> so uh, we've, we've mostly managed, I think, to get kind of g generic terms that could be translated in any language. So games can be used for good. They can. We can get them out really fast. Um, you can start really fast, you can measure them, and uh, you need to involve a designer. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mary Flanagan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you.